Right, well, hello there, and I uh, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. I'm Linda Wallace, and I am Director of Wesleyan Financial Service, and it's an absolute privilege to be chairing tonight's discussion. So the session tonight will be a panel discussion, and we're going to be considering a number of really key questions in relation to the role uh, of women in general practice and also the opportunities and some of the challenges that they face. And it's interesting to note that, you know, women make up more than 50% of the GP workforce across each nation in the UK, as well as more than the majority of people coming into UK medical school in terms of entrance. That's the start point of this evening. As I said, it's a massive, massive topic and we're really excited to, um, to, to, to be looking into this with you this evening. Uh, just as a reminder, the session will be recorded um, and it will be sent to everyone who's registered afterwards. So introducing the panel, as I said, I'm Linda Wallace, Director of WFS, and I'm absolutely delighted tonight to be joined by, uh, by Dr. Sally Hemans, who's a GP partner, RCGP examiner and educator, Dr. Oman Imohi, an award-winning GP and founder and CEO of Black Women in Health, by Wendy Bailey, who's regional manager in Wesleyan Financial Services, who has many, many years experience in providing advice specifically to GPs. And last but not least, Lisa Worsop, uh, who's a financial advisor in, in Wesleyan Financial Services, again, looking after a number of GP clients in the Coventry and the Warwickshire areas. So we move on to the next slide. Before we start, um, um, if you would like to ask a question uh, of the panel during the session, and I'd really encourage as much participation as possible, can you please use the Q&A function? Uh, that's located on the Zoom taskbar at the bottom of the screen. And now you'll be able to see as well all the questions that are coming in um, from other people that have joined us this evening. Um, and if you can like any questions that you see that other people have submitted, that would be great. Um, you know, due to the large number of people in the session tonight, um, you know, that would really help us to, to prioritise the questions and make sure that we cover all the key ones as we go through the session. Now, now in advance of tonight, we've had some fantastic questions submitted um, and we're going to look at these shortly, but I do want to caveat that we won't be able to deal with every question that's asked tonight. Um, so you will have a chance to let us know which areas you'd like more on um, and we can give you feedback on that after tonight's event. But as I said, you know, please feel free to use the chat function as well. Uh, and if you're able to pop any questions for the panel directly uh, into the Q&A, that will make it a lot easier for us to make sure we, we come to them as we go through the discussion. So that's great. So we go to the next slide. So um, just wanted to have a, a look at the responses to the first three pre-event questions that we sent out. Um, so let's have a look at this. So the first one. So have you experienced any barriers to your career progression? And as you can see, 38% answered no to this, although um, there are clearly a significant number of people in the other categories that are highlighted. The second question was, do you think that there are negative perceptions around working less than full time? And a staggering 91.5% said yes, so that's certainly something I'm sure we can spend some time on this evening. And the last question, how, in, how well informed are you about financial implications of your career choices? And again, a significant majority here, 80% said less than well informed. And again, we'll make sure that we draw on that later in, in the session. And the next slide, please. So these were just some of the comments that came in to the responses to the final pre-event question. And you can see a sample of these answers that, that were provided. Um, some really key messages here, you know, the privilege of caring for and being trusted by other women, you know, not being the only woman as I frequently was in a previous career, just take some time to just absorb some of the feedback that we've had to that really key question. And again, we'll look as much as we can this evening with our panellists to, to cover off those as we go through the session. So on to tonight's session, if we go to the next slide, just wanted to give you a flavour of what we're going to cover tonight. So we've got some really key questions here and we'll be looking at the opportunities and challenges that working in general practice provides for women. Um, as a woman in general practice, can you really have it all? And how do you balance work and family lives? 
We will be looking at some of the other specific considerations that, um, that, that women GPs may have to, to look at and consider. And then lastly, we'll be looking at what the panel think the role of women and how that will change in general practice over the next five to 10 years. And then we'll also have another opportunity to answer some questions from the floor. And as I said, please keep sending your questions through um, as we go through the session and use the chat facility if you can. Um, we'll also be having some short polls and I would just really encourage everybody, if you can, to, to give us a response. Really important that we can get a sense of, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the, the thoughts and feelings in the room. So on to the first question. Um, so what are the main opportunities or the challenges that working in general practice and that provides for women? And I'd like to start if we can uh, with you, Sally, um, with your experience. Um, it'd be great to just share your, your perspective on that first question. Yeah, thanks, Linda. I think it's it's such a huge question, isn't it? And I'd written down actually all the things that came up in that, in those sort of samples you've given up that I've been really privileged, I think. And I think um, my demographic is probably different to quite a lot of the people joining this. So um, uh, I think that it's been an adaptable and a flexible career. It's given me status and opportunities. And I've learned lots of transferable skills that have allowed me to do lots of other roles whether they're voluntary things like school boards and other things over the years I think learning that there's a season in life and you don't have to do all these things at one time and there's not necessarily a right time um, and that you might come and I'm I, you know I didn't do training for quite a long time of being a GP so I think that you can make it your own your career path and I think I suppose the most important thing for me is that most of the time, not all of the time, most of the time, I still think it's a great privilege, actually, to walk alongside patients who share their innermost thoughts and their life with me. So I think it's been a it's been a big opportunity. Um, and and, a, and I still think it's a privilege. <clears throat> And, and, and if you if you were to pick out one key thing there, Sally, what do you think the best part of it's been for you if you had to if you had to focus on one area? I think oh, what would I think was the best thing? I've worked with lots. Uh, so um, I think working with patients and the privilege of that has been great. Mm. But actually, all the people I've worked with, I've worked with lots of different people in lots of different roles that I've had. Um, and with lots of people, for example, in my examiner role, who still have an enthusiasm for, for general practice. And I think that's been really helpful for me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the flexibility, as you say, is phenomenal as well, Sally. And I think that's probably something that we'll want to touch on a bit later. Thanks for sharing that. And um, Oman, if I, if I can come on to you next. It would be great just to get your perspective on, on that as well. Thanks. I think I'll be echoing exactly what Sally has said. The job is rewarding. I know um, in, in the recent years, there have been some challenges, but the opportunities as a woman in GP is the fact that it's flexible. Um, the possibilities are limitless. You can do so much or so little, depending on how you want your career to be. You have to define what, it, you know, what success means to you or what the career progression means to you and what you like to achieve. But the possibilities are limitless. You can do so many things. Like Sally has said already, she does other things. And I've found that since I became a GP, I was able to do other things, pursue my other passions and hobbies as well. And you know, that relationship with your patients, building relationships from cradle, you know, till end of life when you're holding their hands and making sure they're getting the best care you know, you can't put a price on that, being there for someone, making a difference. So that opportunity, I think is actually a privilege to be a GP, to be there for people, to make a difference, not just for one patient, but for your entire community. Um, another thing I think is a very good opportunity for us is the status. Yeah, we, we do get, um, we should get the respect. Um, it, not, it might not be there as much, but yeah, it's a, it's a job that, you know, you find fulfillment from and, um, in many ways, not just from, you know, the clinical aspect, in many ways, you get fulfillment from it. And you get to meet new people, you get to meet people, you get to engage with other people. For me, being a woman in GP, I've been able to connect with the college. And I have met a lot of people that, you know, normally just being in my practice, I never would have met 
being able to connect with these people have opened doors for me or opened my eyes to see, you know, what the college does for me and what I can do for the college as well. So there's a lot of things that, you know, you can gain from, or we gain actually from being women in general practice. Yeah, it's really interesting what you said there, Amon, about flexibility and being able to follow other pursuits and interests. Is there anything else you can add to that? Because I'm sure there's a number of people um, listening in tonight that will be very intrigued as to how, you know, how, how you've managed to do that. Um, so when I first finished, when I first CCT'd about six or just over six years ago, I um, went into salaried position first. And then after that, I went on mat leave for a year almost a year. Um, but I went back to work just before my year was over, but I, I didn't go back to my salary job. I went low in and part-time I could do other things. Like I could chase my other dreams. I really wanted to um, set up a group for black women in health to be a, a network and a forum where we could support each other, you know, just empower each other and be there for each other. And just being able to do that for me is like one of the best things that I've you know, gained and being able to connect with the college based on that as well, like taking our, you know, our problems to the college to say, these are the things people are saying, being a voice for these ladies. I think that's something that's, that's been good. I've been able to, um, to join the college as a um, nationally elected council member. Um, I've been able to be very active in the BAME forums with the college. I've been able to do things in my local practices, you know, um, writing audits, submitting to NICE and things like that. And I've also been able to, um, you know, I'm, I was recently nominated as the um, vice chair for Mercy Board, faculty board. And I think just being, being in the profession, seeing what the problems are and, you know, being able to kind of be a voice and wanting to do something about it. This gives me the opportunity for those things, yeah, so yeah. Well, I think there's a key message here, isn't there, um, in terms of flexibility and fulfillment. And I mean, the passion is so strong here in terms of the connection with, you know, patients, with communities and, and, with, and with some of the other fantastic, um, you know, activities that you've just highlighted there. Um, and and, and a, little, a little segue here then, I suppose, Wendy, to, 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 to you first, if I may. Um, some of the, the points that have covered there will be areas, I'm sure, that in your role, you know, dealing with GPs, um, from an advi advisory capacity, you must um, have come up against many, many situations where you've been able to, you know, help and provide support and guidance. It'd be great if, if you were able to share just, just some examples. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, I mean, I would echo absolutely what both Sally and Oman have said in that, um, you know, in my experience with clients over, over the years, it's a fantastic profession to be in that gives you lots of flexibility there's lots of choice the you know bringing in the, the, the kind of finance picture there aren't many professions left in this day and age that can give you the level of of job security that general practice provides and um, also there's transferable skills you can choose where you want to work whether that's in the UK or somewhere else in the world then um, the world really is your, your oyster um, and also just bringing in the pension scheme. Nobody's mentioned that yet, but I'm going to mention it now. I'll probably mention it again before we stop tonight. It's a fantastic pension scheme. You've got real mm. security there, not just through your professional life, but into retirement as well. And over the years, my GP clients come to me with lots of questions around uh, the, the flexibility of their career and when they're thinking about changing what impact is that change going to have on their financial plan? What else, what else do they need to do to plan for, for the change? What benefits might they give up, for example, if they move from um, a GP partner to a, a GP locum? Just kind of similar to what Oman said earlier, she was a salary GP and then she went to be locum. There's, there's differences in uh, benefits around that. So lots of decisions and lots of these decisions can be made really quickly, but they should be made with with one eye on your, your financial plan all the time. Yeah, and um, there's lots of acknowledgements there, Wendy. I can see your heads nodding. So I think clearly people resonate with the fact that support's out there. Um, but, I, but I think, and Lisa, just coming to you too, I mean, you've obviously got a, a wealth of experience dealing with um, the GPs in your area. And I know that you have lots and lots of discussions just trying to help people navigate um, through the choices and, you know, financial well-being 
been you know a, a really key critical part of the support role that you can provide so uh, really uh, it'd be great to just get, get your reflection on some of those discussions that you've had yeah yeah that's right Linda so um I mean, nowadays it's um, more common for GPs to have a varied role than just simply being a salaried GP or a partner GP. We quite often um, take on other roles in terms of, um, like you say, locuming and doing salaried, salaried roles as well. Um, so quite often I'll have clients that will contact me wanting advice around their financial planning because of things like that they're thinking of doing. Um, um, in terms of varying their roles, reducing hours, um, and then obviously looking at things like also um, go, going into the partnership um, and going into that role also. So um, as, as Wendy's already said, it's really important to get that financial advice to see how that is going to impact them. Well, that's great news. So I think uh, the good news is, though, that there's lots of help at hand and uh, that moves us on beautifully, if we can, to the first of this evening's polls. Um, we've heard a lot about flexibility. So is having greater flexibility to have a family or pursue other activities, as we heard from the panellists now, and going to be an influence in your career choice to become a GP? Um, yes, greatly, somewhat or not at all. Let's just give people a little bit of time to respond to that. It'd be really interesting to see um, what the poll says. And I'll share that with you in a second. So greater flexibility, but you've heard how much does that really influence you and your choice of becoming a GP? Are we just about ready, I think, for the, the poll outcome? Yes, we are. Right. OK, so, gosh, 76% uh, have said yes greatly, 22% um, somewhat. So that's staggering. That's over 90. Nearly everyone either greatly or somewhat as a consideration and 2% not at all. And clearly, you know, everybody will have a different perspective on, uh, on that question. But that takes us beautifully then into the second question. And, you know, as if we go to the next slide, as a woman in general practice, can you really have it all? In fact, there's a few questions coming through, I think, with uh, that will link nicely into, into this question. So how on earth do you really balance work and family lives? Can we really do that? Is it, is it superwoman or is it, is it actually um, a, a practically possible? So um, um, Iman, if we can come to you first, it'd be great to just uh, share your insights of how you've managed that yourself. Thank you. I think um, Sally alluded to this before when she said something about, you know, you don't have to do it all at the same time. So I believe that in our lives, we all have seasons and you need to know what season you are in in your life. If you're newly qualified, your season is different from someone who's mid-career or towards the end of their career. So for me, I think a few things I, I put into consideration was evaluating my personal situation. And I think everyone needs to tailor it to themselves, you know, assess your situation, you know, what is most important for you. Define what success in your career and in other aspects of your life means to you. And that would help you really understand what your demands are for your professional life and for your personal life. So for example, if you have small kids, I have small kids. When I was a GP trainee, I had my first child when I was a trainee. And then I had my second child after I became a GP. So I had little kids when I was preparing for exams and you know trying to CCT and all that. So it was difficult, but I had to understand the demands of my life and find out ways to um, kind of juggle them together. And the ways I did it is by planning. I plan so well. I plan, I have books where I write my plan for the day, my plan for the week, my plan for the month. And I think everyone should plan. You should have a booklet where you write your, your to-do list all the time. Plan, 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 because if you don't plan, you'll fail. So plan how you're going to, who's going to take care of your child when you're working, who's going to take care of your kids when you need to read, when you need to attend a course or an event. And you need to be aware that you might have to sacrifice. And that's where having it all, you know, comes that can you really have it all you might have to sacrifice some things for some other things at certain points in your life 
there might be a point in your life where you need to pass an exam. So you, you're focusing all your energy or your attention to your RCA or your, you know, your exams, basically. And then there might be times when you don't have an exam and now you can focus more time on your family or some hobbies you have or other things you want to do. But always remember to be a full jog because an empty jog does not pour. So, you know, in as much as we are so passionate about taking care of everyone else, it's our nature as women to always want to pour and pour and pour to others and take care of other people. But make sure that you fill yourself up, take time off, rest, rejuvenate, do the things you love. Don't feel guilty. If you've not achieved what you thought you would achieve five years ago or 10 years ago or two years ago, don't feel guilty. Don't compare yourself with anyone else but yourself because you are your only competition. Don't look at anybody else's race or anybody else's journey to determine your life because your, your, your situations are different and very importantly, delegate, outsource if you need to. So for example, outsourcing, you can have a cleaner to help you do your cleaning at home. If you're having exams and you're so tied up with work, you can have someone to help you mind the kids. You can have a child minder. You can ask your spouse or your partner to help you. You can ask family members to help you outsource, outsource, outsource and delegate because I can't overemphasize that aspect. Thank you. We, yeah, we've got some fantastic comments coming through actually on this. And as a mother of two and a working mother of two, I've been through that myself. I absolutely know I had lists on lists on lists. Um, and <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a question that's come up um, there about this, the guilt is so hard. Yeah. And you've touched on that there, Iman. But um, if you could if you could answer that that question directly, um, just to, just to sort of like you know, to, to highlight that they're not on their own. What would you say? I'll say be kind to yourself, you know, treat yourself the way you treat other people. Sometimes the guilt is because, oh, I have to rush off work now. I have to leave now. I can't do any extra work because I need to pick up my kids because nursery closes at six. You might feel guilty on your way driving down. And then you're, as you're driving down, you're guilty that my child is the last child again today. That probably happens to all of us. You know, if you have kids in nursery, your child is probably always the last to be picked up. And you're like feeling guilty about that as well. And then you're guilty about the fact that you might have to, you know, just, you know, defer something from the fridge and not make anything fresh from scratch. You know, free yourself, be kind to yourself and don't let guilt, don't, don't feel guilty because at the end of the day, you're one person trying to do so many things. And that's why planning helps because there are certain things you put in, in motion that just automates your day for you. So that's why going back to the first thing, planning so that the guilt will be less at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I, I think I think a great point there, isn't there? That there's a massive network around to draw on, and uh, I think many women, certainly that I speak to, are uh, are normally the ones that are trying to control everything. So I think there is a little bit, as you say, of just having a look to see what support is there and, and really use it. And Sally, that's a a, a a great point to come back to you on. And uh, um, I can see you were nodding all the way through uh, in Mom's points there. You've had obviously experience yourself, but it'd be great just to get your perspective on this. So if there's anything else you can you can share. Yeah, certainly. I'm at a different I'm at a different stage to Amon, and I my children are. 24, 28 and 29 and I have two who ended up doing medicine despite me being a GP and uh, a, a mum whose husband worked away from home in financial services who at the beginning there was going to be a joint sharing of childcare but that never really seemed to happen um, and of course I, I mean Amon set out very clearly a plan that she had and I would have to say that wasn't quite the same for me um, so can you have it all? Yeah, probably, but maybe not in the order in which you think it's going to happen. Um, and certainly when I started, it was much more difficult. There was much less opportunity. I think at the moment, there's great opportunity for flexible working. Uh, when I started, I was asked um, if my husband would be at home to answer the phone when I was on call and we did all our own on call. And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, well, he needs to be. Well, he won't be. Um, uh, so uh, things like that have changed immensely. And you've gone from I have had a career pro progression, which was perhaps not what I expected. So I was a retainer. When I started, I did locums, you could only do two sessions a week and retainers weren't paid. So I was out with the NHS pension scheme at that stage, which is different now. 
Um, in Scotland, we still have the retainer scheme and we've got a re we haven't at the moment got a retainer, we have got a returner. Um, and I think that mentoring with people around you is really helpful. Um, and I think somebody said about guilt and I've seen the words imposter syndrome and we all have that, all right? So last night after we had a, what are we doing tomorrow session, I texted my daughters to say, okay, what have been the benefits, the pros and the cons of having a GP mum? thinking I'd get this huge tirade back. I had one negative, okay? And I don't know if anyone could possibly predict that, but it's from one of the medics. So the medical student, her negative was that I always know how much I don't know, okay? And that was her sole negative from all the, you know, well, what about the times when you had to have different people? Oh no, it was great, mum, it was great. We had great people come and look after us. We did really different things. They didn't worry about X, Y, and Z. And we learned to do lots of things. I think an overriding uh, feeling from them was that I worked part time in, in theory, but in practice, it, it wasn't like that. And that I had a career, not just a job, um, but I was always also there for them. Um, and I think you have to do what works for you. My husband worked away, so I wanted to be there more days than I wasn't to pick them up. Um, and at one point I ended up not doing general practice working in a hospice because we'd moved with my husband's job. So I think sometimes it's about grasping the opportunities that are around you. Um, and at times on the good days, you'll really think you can have it all. And there's quite a lot of days where you don't think you're actually juggling any of the balls properly and they're all falling down. And you do something completely different because you think that's a job that is completed. Um, I used to say, I, and I still say often when I'm talking to younger GPs, that actually I, I often thought the GP part of my life was actually the easier part because it was more finite than the washing basket at home, for example, that was never empty. Yeah, yeah. well, there's, there's lots of comments coming through here. I think, Sally, you, the children are very resilient, aren't they? And I think, you know, the, the importance, as you say, of, um, of, of, of just trying to not put a, a very amount of pressure on yourself. And, uh, and as you say, the experience can actually be a really positive one. And many people I speak to that have worked full time, you know, have, have had exactly the same feedback from the children when they've gone through the other end. Um, and, and, and uh, I'll come to you first, Wendy, and next, Wendy, again, if you can, because obviously some of the topics here, um, you are having regular discussions, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with, 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 with your client GPs. And a big thing that I think came up is, 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 is empowerment, you know, take control, you can do this. So um, what are some of the conversations you're having, just to give a perspective, I suppose, on um, financial well-being, as well as obviously having uh, everything else all, uh, all in order? Thanks, Linda. Firstly, I just want to say, I don't know about delegate, but if anybody's ever tried to delegate filling the dishwasher to a child, it's it's an impossible task. And if you found the answer to that, um, please feel free to pop that in the Q&A because I would be delighted. Um, but yeah, cli my clients, absolutely. There, there's probably two pieces of, of advice that I would pass on around this and you can have it all and just as Sally and Oman have said maybe not all at the same time I think whether we've got children or, or not or whether we've got other um, interests outside of work we're all as women used to spinning lots of plates and we quite quickly I think get quite adept at that and, and your career is, is probably half or more of those plates and it's really important and I hate to say the S word, the structured word, um, always makes me reverse slightly, uh, but structure in some form in your life to help you to plan is really, really important. It builds in flexibility, um, it builds in options, it helps you to prepare. And if you can find a, an advisor who you trust and who can stick with you throughout and who you can pick up the phone to and say to them, I'm thinking of going and doing this. I'm thinking of having a career break. I wanna to go to New Zealand for a year. What's gonna to happen to my pension? can I do that then that's going to be really really helpful to you I think in, in your working life and to help you to plan on where you're going to go next and which plates you're going to spin next year or the year after or the year after and what impact they're going to have on your, your finances and your job security and your financial security um, and if I can I would give you another little top tip everybody at home if you can every day make time to have lunch 
and there's loads and loads of meanings behind that uh, and I, I tell that to all my clients because you're all running at 130 miles an hour all the time and nobody has time for themselves you're doing I guess what is on paper at a seven hour day but you're actually doing a 16 hour day and before you you realize you haven't eaten anything, you've grabbed a coffee from the kitchen on the way past, and um, you're so focused on your patients and your to-do list and everything that you're doing, you forget that you matter and you can't take care of those patients unless you take care of yourself. And that comes from a financial aspect, but it also comes from a personal aspect as well. So if you've been one of my clients over the years, you may have been lucky enough to, to get some biscuits uh, for every meeting or a piece of cake because I know exactly what it's like. Uh, and my second top tip, as I said, would be please always make time for some lunch. We've had a great comment there, lunch and quietness, a distant memory, and uh, some fantastic tips too on loading of dishwashers, but not worrying oh, if, it's not, if it's not loaded the same way as we would do it. But uh, um, Lisa, just coming back to just sort of following on from what Wendy was saying there, I know you have um, have spent quite a bit of time with, uh, with clients that are at the earlier stages in their career um, and that aren't quite sure, you know, the, um, the, the, the questions that they might need to address. So can you share any of your top tips and any examples of, uh, of, of, of how you've helped your clients in that? Yeah, so I think um, it's just really, the real importance is really understanding the client's journey and where they're actually at at that moment in time, but then also what their plans are for the future. Um, so as Wendy says, it's it really important to financially plan as well as obviously planning your career out there as well. Um, and that can then sometimes make your decisions a bit easier. Um, if you've put plans in place early on in terms of savings and, um, and investing and things like that, that can then um, give you more choices um, and more freedoms to do things like maybe reducing hours, um, starting families, um, and, or even doing other roles outside the NHS and looking how that will then affect your long-term plans in terms of retirement planning. Yeah, um, I know somebody has put something in the chat as well, which I, I totally agree with in terms of um, the, the men comment. I don't know whether anybody's seen that. But it is, I, as a um, single parent, it is really frustrating because generally men don't really seem to have to deal with the, the issue of balancing your career and your work or even sorting out childcare, for example. For some reason, it always falls on us and it is frustrating. Um, but I have also had clients as well where very like obviously it's not really common but where they do share things equally and it's about having that communication with with your partner and obviously the wider family as well and and asking for help I know I've been really bad in the past at not asking for help and trying to just manage things out on my own because it feels like you're failing if you're asking for help um but yeah so so my my key tip from a personal point of view would be swallow your pride and just ask for help where you can well we're going to uh, thanks lisa that's fantastic we're going to keep on this theme for a little minute we're going to move on to the next poll of this evening um and again if we could just ask for everybody to give us your um your view so this one um is do you understand how career breaks such as parental leave can impact your retirement goals Yes, no, or unsure. Again, it'd be really great just to, to get a sense in the room of uh, how informed people are uh, around certain key aspects of financial wellbeing. Because I think, as we know from some of the comments already this evening, uh, being forewarned and forearmed really helps in some of the key decision making. So we'll just give a, a few more seconds to give everybody a chance to respond to the second poll of this evening. Right, so do you understand how career breaks such as parental leave can impact your retirement goals? Let's now have a look at the result. Gosh, 3% um, have uh, said yes, but a staggering 77% have said no and 20% unsure. So I think that highlights again nearly uh, everyone that's dialed in this evening um, really uh, could, could, could use getting a broader understanding uh, around some of these key questions. So let's take that on to the next slide if we can. And the next question, I think that sets that up really, really well. And um, a question really around, you know, other 
specific considerations that, uh, that women GPs may have. And I think we'll stick at the moment, if we can, to, to some of the financial points that came up here. Wendy, if you'd come to you next. Um, just to kind of follow on from some of the points you raised earlier and uh, be great to share your insights here. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, I said I would talk about pensions some more. So here we go. Um, don't worry, I won't get technical. Um, but, but yes, absolutely. If you take some time out, if, if you want to have children or if you want to go and do something else and you take a break in your career, where you are before you take that break, has a real impact on your NHS pension and whether you're able to continue in that pension scheme or whether you have to come out of the pension scheme and go back in once you come back from your career break. Uh, so it's really important that if you're going to do that, if you're going to take time off for children or take time off for something else, that you talk about it, you plan for it and, and you you seek some help and some guidance and some advice from your, your advisor uh, so that you know whether you're actually in the right role at that point to do or whether you need to maybe move into another role so that it's going to give you access to better benefits um, and so that also you know how you can maybe make up for benefits that you've lost once you return to work and also what impact that's all going to have if you return to work and you do say four sessions a week as a GP rather than seven. Uh, there's, there's lots of, of different impacts there depending on how many sessions you're going to work each week as a GP. Um, other things that can impact your retirement plans is if you move from an employed role to a self-employed role. Uh, it's not always straightforward whether you are able to then uh, continue as a member of the pension scheme and, and to what level. So it's really, really important that you do seek advice and you don't make any decisions just based on, well, I want to go do this, so I'm going to go do this without considering what impact that's going to have. Uh, and actually, starting with the end in mind, where do you want to be? Always keep that in mind. Where do you want to be when you retire? When do you want to retire? It's never too early to think about your exit strategy without trying to get rid of your career before it's over and without trying to you know, take you away from enjoying a fulfilling career. Always have one eye or half an eye on your exit strategy and, and where you want to end up. Wendy, just, just to come back to something you said earlier, empowerment, how important do you think that is uh, in this topic, that people do actually have the knowledge to feel that empowerment? I think actually as a woman, um, in most professions, it's not always easy to, to feel that you've got your own identity and to feel that you are absolutely financially secure without the help of a partner. Um, and so being able to make decisions about your money to understand where that money's going, what that money's doing, when you can access it, how it's going to help you without having to rely on anybody else is massively empowering, I think, for a woman is to be completely self-reliant regardless of, of who else is there in your life. Um, and going back to what Sally said earlier as well about her, her children or daughters, they've had Sally to look at um, through, through them growing up and to kind of aspire towards, I guess. And, and Sally, you must have done something right because uh, they're great girls and, and they've obviously to, to give you that feedback where everything's been really positive is just wonderful. And, and uh, just, just following on from that, Lisa, there's been quite a few uh, comments in the chat. And can I just say, by the way, um, it's fantastic to see these comments coming through and uh, just getting a sense for how some of the, 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 the conversation is landing and just really encourage if you do have any questions, please you know, send them through. And, and Lisa, just coming to you before we, we, um, we move on from, from the, the particular uh, financial point here, um, with some of the, um, the people uh, they, they viewing tonight and uh, they've signed into Tonight are maybe people that are bringing you know families up on their own or people that may be even facing you know going through divorce but there's certainly other um you know big um potential questions that uh, that that can raise and it'd be great just to to get a sense of some of the work that you've been doing because I know that uh, that you've had some clients in, in in those situations yourself recently so can you share some of that with us yeah, sure um firstly I just want to um just emphasize the point of um finding somebody that you can trust um, in terms of getting advice around your finances. It's really important that you have that open relationship with your financial consultants um, and that you can be honest with them and trust them um, in order for um, you to both obviously put a financial plan together. 
Um, quite often I've had clients that have contacted me where they've, they've requested a woman financial consultant as well, because that quite often can make people feel more comfortable um, in, in having that approach there. Um, but I'd say, um, a, well, not a lot of my clients, but some of my clients over the years have contacted me um, because they've been going through divorce. And that has then obviously put a spanner in the works in terms of their um, goals um, and expectations that they had and what their financial situation um, was looking like it was going to be mapped out for. Um, and with with clients like that, it's really obviously giving them the help and the advice that they need um, to ensure that they, they've got their finances in order. So looking at um, the impact of their pension and what that might look like when you've gone through the divorce um, and then looking at other factors as well such as mortgages and, and obviously the protection there too. Um, quite often I find that um, the um, female clients haven't necessarily had um, control over the finances so it can sometimes be a big learning curve for them as well and again it's it's finding that somebody that you feel comfortable with and um, that will hold your hand through that and and take the stress away from it all basically. No oh, that's great Lisa thanks and, and so moving on away slightly from the kind of pure financial um, uh, questions so like, Sally um, what other things and other considerations do you think that um, women GPs may have to take into account. What's your perspective on that one? Um, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked in all the chat about men in the practice. <laughs> and, things, and how do you open that conversation up? So I've just answered that. So I'm actually going to come into that. But actually, I think mm. women, women are great networkers, actually. Um, and so I think we have big opportunities in, in developing our networks to support us and reaching out to people. So um, I think that's really a positive thing about where we're at. The more, the, the, I suppose the challenging things over the years have been, I, I don't do out of hours, but when I did, you had to think about your security um, at times, how we dress, how we're treated. I think there's much less sexism now. I know we're having, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that whilst having seen all this chat about how do we make our husbands or our other halves do this. And there's also some stuff in there about if you don't have children, being a GP is hard and you still need to have work-life balance. And I think that's true. Um, I've got my middle daughter is a is a specialty trainee at the beginning in obstetrics and gynaecology and she's married. And actually she is much better than I ever was at having balance. I would do more of the things that I thought I ought to do in, in other things. She is signed up to doing an art course every week which she totally preserves as far as she can. So she recognizes, I think that you have to have a balance. So I just sort of, I'm slightly sidetracked by those bits in the, on the side, sorry. Um, so what are the other considerations I might have had? Um, I suppose for me, I've gone on to have a caring role as well. And, and actually um, I think that how I balance that up and I am, I've not been doing what Wendy is saying always at thinking, what, what's the implication of this later on? Um, and so sort of backtracking a little bit at the moment about that. And I, for the record, still am not sure when I'm going to retire. So I don't think everyone has to look at Wendy groaning at me. <laughs> Thanks for that, Sally. Yvonne, what's your perspective on this? It'd be great just to, if you can share, you know, any, any insights, all the things that you think, you know, really, these are things you do need to think about. Thank you. So again, I'm just going to come from, from a different angle. Um, and I am Gidat, an international medical graduate. I was fortunate to come into the country and I did my F1, F2, but some people came in just straight into GP training. So a few considerations I would suggest for, um, you know, especially BAME and IMG G women GPs is to understand and adapt to change of the culture and the lifestyle that you're used to. And that goes into the financial aspect as well, if we look at it broadly, broadly I mean, because um, when, when you come, you're just starting, everyone else has been already on the wheel before you came, if you look at it that way. So you're trying to think about childcare, getting a mortgage, getting a house, getting a car. You know, you're trying to do so many things and pass your exams and get job security and all that. But it's good to take, you know, take a step back, you know, plan. Again, plan is very important. Understand the culture, adapt to the changes that you've met. Continue professional development, continue learning. You can never stop learning. 
keep learning, get a mentor. I can't overemphasize that. Get a mentor. Make sure you have someone that you look up to that can advise you, that has been through it all, that can prevent you from making the mistakes they've made. And obviously get a very good support network. I think it's really, really important that you get a good support network. There are so many doctor groups and you know women doctor groups on social media that you can join. Get into one of them, get the support you need. Um, but more importantly, I think some specific considerations I would say for women GPs to so remember that you are your superpower. You are unique, you're special, know yourself, know your worth, know your identity, know your purpose. And never fail to negotiate well, you know, when you're going for a job interview, sell yourself, don't shrivel and hide and, you know, think anyone is thinking she's just a woman, know yourself, be fearless in this journey, true GP, because it's a journey you're going to be here doing it for the rest of your life, except you change your career. And remember that you have choices, you have to be intentional about them. Every choice you make at every point of your career really matters because it can determine, you know, it can make or break you. So be very careful the choices you make. Be very careful to recognize opportunities and take them, grab them with both hands and go for it. Even if you don't feel you're qualified enough, go for it. Forget that imposter syndrome, go for it. Be ambitious. There's nothing wrong in being ambitious. There's nothing wrong in being hungry. As a woman, there's nothing wrong in wanting more, you know, more for your family, more for yourself, more for your career. It, it goes round in all aspects of your life. So there's nothing wrong in wanting more. So no matter where you are in life or in your career, you are okay to want more and don't settle. Sometimes you might find yourself in a job where you are not valued, where you are not respected, leave. You don't need to sit there. The, the, the beauty about GPs is that flexible that, you know, if, if you're not treated right somewhere, you can always say, well, I've done my best. I'll try somewhere else. So don't settle. Step out of your comfort zone. Take risks and get out there. And most importantly, surround yourself with the right people. Like I said, join networks, you know, get into those groups, get a mentor, get people who have been through the road and through, through the path to, to get you through. Thank you. Oh, there's some great points there. And I think, you know, believe in yourself, value yourself. I think there's loads of comments coming through, actually, Mon, about one point you made there about a mentor. Um, and I know in the, the chat, there's um, uh, there's a mention of the RCGP mentoring programme. But I think, uh, Iman and Sally, I think um, it'd be really good just to come back to both of you on that particular point. So um, if, if there's anybody uh, listening in tonight that thinks, um, how do I do it? What's the benefit? Can you share any of your experiences on uh, being at the receiving end or indeed mm. uh, as, as, a, as a mentor? I think quite often mentoring uh, sort of evolves by chance, actually. Um, sometimes it's that you've, um, well, for me, I'm, I'm in a different phase possibly where you've, you've been asked, you, you've seen somebody as a potential medical student and they come back to you, your trainees will appear back to you. So it's not always a formal thing, mentoring. And I know that I've been certainly encouraged and mentored by people I've worked alongside and um, from when I was training through my life and I think that's a great privilege I think people will often go back to people who've lifted them up and encouraged them um, and somebody's put in the chat about so certainly I'm, I'm an Edinburgh GP um, and Lothian now have a sort of mentoring and support scheme um, some areas are more developed than others I think RCGP generally has bigger schemes if you want them um, I think lots of people find peer mentoring, so peer groups is also a great way of supporting each other. Um, and in, uh, in Scotland, I think it's more of a Scottish. So I, I grew up as a GP in, in England, but I've been in Scotland for more than 20 years. Um, and so we have lots of things called PBSGL. I think the other place that some people are turning to are our social media forums, actually, where you can bounce something out. And I swing between thinking these are great. So on Facebook, like GP Survival or whatever, um, I'm a member of several. Sometimes I think they're great. Sometimes I think they're a bit negative um, and it's about turning those off. But they are a great place for people to say, I'm, I'm a GP in this area. Can anyone help me? So there are lots and lots of different ways of, of engaging with people who, you know, I'm thinking about doing X, where do I go for that? Um, often the deanery has advice too. So your deanery will often know someone or you, you may just happen to know medicine is quite a small world. Um, and, and most of us know somebody who knows somebody. So we know who to ask to say, okay, so you've got an interest in sports medicine. Oh, you know, 
X, I know this. Or so it, it's quite easy if you ask. I think it's back to what Amon um, Amon said that you just need to ask sometimes. No, Lisa said that too. Lisa said. <laughs> Swallow your, that wasn't about this, that was about something else, but she said, swallow your pride and ask, which actually a lot of us aren't very good at because we think we should do it. And some, sometimes that's a control thing about um, somebody put on the dishwasher, you've got to let them stack it however they want to. But some of us still want some china left at the end of that, but yeah. Well, I think the message here again is there's an awful lot of support out there and, uh, and, and I think some great comments. I mean, there's masses of questions coming through actually at the moment and I'll, I'll stay on this uh, before we move on to the next session. A couple of things came out around um, when, when to have children, maternity pay implications and options for returning as a locum. I mean, all those are, are sort of key, uh, key sort of separate points, but when to have children is, is a big, big question. But the implications in terms of maternity pay and and kind of options. Wendy, could I maybe come start with you on that? Is there anything you can you can um, you know su suggest uh, in those areas? Uh, firstly, yes, the, there's never a right time to have children. I have five, and and none of them was the right time. <laughs> Didn't put me off though. Um, yeah, maternity pay, paternity pay. Um, it's more you get more money if you're in a salaried role before you go off on leave than you would if you were a GP partner self-employed. So if you're a GP partner self-employed, every single one of my clients say to me, I've got to save to have a child so that I can be off for six months, eight months, however long I want to be off uh, before I come back. Um, and and it, that makes me sad. It's always made me sad. And I think women should be supported to have children and um, I do think it's a little bit unfair and partnership agreements if you go back to partnership agreements uh, they're never really made with women in mind they don't seem to be and they're actually quite difficult to understand and clients come to me time and time again and, and hold a partnership agreement up and say what does this mean? What does this give me? Uh, and it's really important to look at it differently and to say, well, what do I want from that partnership agreement? It's my partnership. If, if that agreement isn't something that I want, what do I want out of it? And then take it to your lawyer and, and get it drawn up the way that you want it. And, and you're completely in charge of that. So you could be in a position where you could make it easier for women in your practice uh, to take time off to have babies. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a, a link to that point as well and uh, Oman if it's okay if I could come to you on this particular one but it's somebody's yeah. raised a point about when to have children and kind of coming back as a locum or indeed applying for leadership roles and um, can you give some guidance and advice on that particular point? Um, just like Wendy said there's no perfect time if it happens it happens but if I was to go back to um, if I was if I was to just speak normally without looking at you know, perfect. If you are planning and deciding when you want to have it, when you want to have your kids, probably during training will be the best time. I'll be honest with you. I had my first during training, and I took a year off mat leave, and then I had the second one when I was um, when I just became a salary GP, and I didn't read my contract well, <laughs> so there was no mat leave pay basically. So I had to go, I went, I went on mat leave and for both pregnancies, whether I was going a year or not, I walked till, because it was, I didn't have any complications or any problems. So I walked till, you know, 38 weeks, 39 weeks for both. And then when I went on mat, when, I, when it was almost time, that's when I realized that there was no pay. But if you're in a job where you've been there for longer, longer than 12 months, you, will, you should have your mat leave pay. But still, again, you can take a year off if you are, if you are an employee. But if you're a partner, it's, it's a bit different. And if you're a locum, it's also different because there's a lot of things to consider. So for me, um, it was okay because my husband supported me and I had savings as well. So I took seven months off for my second child. So, you know, in hindsight, when you're a trainee, you have a lead employer and, um, you know, taking your mat leave is, is a different structure from when you become a GP partner or especially if you're locum and then I went into locum and if you decide to go into locum you need, you need to take a lot of things into consideration for me I've got young children so when I started locum in I spoke to a financial advisor and I took a few steps so I made sure obviously I have kids now I need life insurance I need critical illness I need um um 
I had about I have about four or five different insurances that I use at the moment. I you need a um what do you call this now? Um income protection insurance as mm -hmm. well, because if you're a locum, you could be unwell at any point and you don't have sick pay. So I took all of that because I went back into salary at some point. But during that period when I took when I went to locum full time, I took those things. My reason for going locum then was I needed the flexibility. I wanted to have time for my kids. I wanted to be able to work. The, the amount of days I wanted, take breaks up when I needed for their school holidays, because I found that with salary, you need to, you need to, you know, get holidays with other partners and other salaried. And sometimes you might not get the days you want. So I, I needed that freedom and that's why I did it. But you need to make sure you speak to a financial advisor, make sure that you have things set in place for protection, just in case. Oh, some great, great insights and, uh, and, and advice there. Thank you for that. Um, I'm very conscious there's quite a number of questions that have come through. There's some in particular um, uh, relating to the impact on pension. That's quite a specific uh, point. So um, we might have to just follow up on that um, afterwards and then come back. So I'm conscious we, we, we've got another quite key question. I'd like to move on, if we may, to, to, to the next question, because I think something that um, is, is, is going to be quite interesting is just, you know, what we think the future of the profession holds for women uh, GPs and 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 particularly, you know, what what we think that might look like over the next five to, to 10 years. Uh, Oman, can I start with you, if, if I may? What's your what's your perspective in terms of where what you think the future might hold? The future is female, so <laughs> the future. Um, we we've already seen the revolution and the changes happening. We've had you know um, female. We've had women chair as RCG. We've had a we've had women as RCGP chair. We've had women as RCGP presidents. In fact, the last president was a woman. The next one is the the new one is a woman. Who knows what might happen next next one? So the future is for women. I think we need to take it. The future of GP um, for women is to hopefully get a profession that adapts to us, that makes it flexible for us to surround child, to wrap childcare around our profession and support us with continued um, professional development and also support us with leadership, you know, giving us opportunities for leadership, giving us the, the avenue to actually take those leadership roles because it's one thing for the leadership roles to be there, but it's another thing to make it possible for you to take it. For, for us as women. And one thing we've seen from the pandemic is that remote working is here to stay for certain aspects of medicine. So that might be something to factor into for moms of small children or someone who may not have small children, but might have someone they're caring for at home. That's a woman GP working remotely and leading remotely. I think those are things that we can look into for the future when it comes to the profession. So lots of positivity um, for the future years ahead. What, what's your view on this, Sally? Um, I, I think that I, I, I wouldn't really separate women from men, actually. I would be thinking about the future of general practice because that's a huge question, I think, at the moment. I think there has been a huge evol uh, evolution and move away from sexism. I know some people are saying, how do you get more men in leadership or how do you get more women in leadership within practices? I think it will just, it evolves in different practices and, and that may be a culture within a practice that you maybe want to move away from because actually I've never worked in a practice. I've, I think I've always worked in a practice where the, fee, the there have been more females than males, actually. Um, I think the change of what's considered full time has happened in my time um, and say, so, um five sessions is now much is is, is, is less part-time than it was when I started because full-time was 10 sessions and eight sessions is full-time now in our practice I think in 10 years I probably won't be a GP almost certainly I won't be a GP in 10 years but I will need a GP and the things I value about general practice are the things that I hope that it can hold on to so continuity of care for example um and I think these other things that we do um, are really important. So for me, being an examiner has been a really gift for me to do, even though I did it when I was a retainer, because it's about maintaining standards and, and a professional standing of general practice in a, is in a very changing NHS. I think I'm slightly nervous to even think where the NHS is going to be in 10 years, 
and I've got two daughters who are in the NHS um, and medicine. So I am hopeful that with all our impact, input that general practice will still be looking after us all. Um, and I'll stop coughing. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. And just very quickly, Wendy and Lisa, final sort of perspective from, from you on this. I would agree with, with both Sally and, and Omon. I think it's really exciting general practice coming, especially with the fact that the majority of GPs are now women. Um, but also Sally has a great point in that I think I had two clients who worked 10 sessions and the majority by far work five or seven sessions. And that means more numbers in the practices and, and uh, different ways of working, I guess, coming in there. Um, but just to kind of end on the, the financial aspect, I see there's a lot of questions coming through on the chat around specifics around pensions and protection, etc. Just so that you, everybody at home knows, there are about 250 specialist financial advisors working with, with Wesleyan all up and down the country in all different corners of the country from Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England. Um, 60 of them ish are like Lisa and they specialise in GPs. And um, so Lisa only provides advice to GPs. So she's absolutely the best person to see to talk about your NHS pension, to talk about the, the things that we've all discussed tonight. And if you want help with your financial plan. Yeah, I'm just very conscious we are out of time now, and uh, and we obviously put in the chat we will come round to any questions that we didn't uh, that we didn't manage to answer today. But I think I just want to make the point. I mean, you know, Western Financial Services is are the exclusive financial advice provider for RCGP, and if we just move on to the next slide, and uh, um, you know, that's clearly something as as we say that we do have you know a team of specialist advisors all over the UK. Um, that, that can obviously deal with um, it, deal with any of the, the points that have come this evening. Um, but I'm, I am conscious of everybody's time. I just really want to um, to say a massive, massive thank you to our panel um, for, for the time and knowledge and the brilliant insight tonight. Um, and to everybody who's dialed in, I really hope that the subjects that we've covered tonight have been really useful and that, uh, that, that you've been able to take away some really, really key points. Um, I just want to just finish off by saying as the session is closing, you will get an email um, and in that email, there will be a link to a short survey. Um, and we just ask everybody to uh, really, really appreciate if you could complete that. It lets all of us review, you know, the value that you've had from this evening, you know, what we might need to change or do differently, um, and also to shape the content of future sessions. And, uh, you know, if there is a, a demand for that, clearly we want to be uh, guided by, you know, what we know will be a real benefit to you. So, and make sure we're delivering that content. Um, and in the next few days, you will also um, get um, a, an email to, to link to the recording of, of tonight's session. If you want to revisit any point or indeed share with friends or, or colleagues. Um, and the emails that you get will also include, as we said, how you can arrange um, and contact uh, Wesley. And um, if you do feel that it would be of benefit discussing some of the points tonight with your local Wesleyan Financial Services consultant. And again, really passionate about that and, uh, and supporting you where we can. So to get to, you know, a no, a no obligation appointment with one of our Wesleyan Financial Services consultants, if anybody wants to do that, you can scan the QR code uh, that you can see uh, on the screen or indeed follow the link uh, that uh, is in the chat. So uh, it goes without saying, um, really appreciate everybody's support this evening and for dialing in. It's been a wonderful and a real privilege for me to be chairing uh, tonight's discussion. Um, and uh, I, as I said, I hope that that has been a really valuable session. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye for now.